There's a great book written by a guy named Tim Chester I like a lot called A A Meal with Jesus. I'll read to you a little bit of what he says. He says, food matters. Meals matter. Meals are full of significance. Few acts are more expressive of companionship than the shared meal. Someone with whom we share food is likely to be our friend or well on the way to becoming one. The word companion comes from the Latin come, means together, and ponus for bread. We have all... We all have favorite images of good hospitality. I think of my friends Andy and Josie in their farmhouse kitchen, vegetables fresh with garden mud, hot buns with a shiny glaze, warmth from the old stove, and the gentle flow of conversation from which talk of God is never absent for long. Think about your dining room table or kitchen table. What dramas have been played out over this simple piece of furniture? Day by day, you've chatted with your family, sharing news, telling stories, poking fun, Values have been imbibed. Guests have been welcomed. People have found a home. Love has blossomed. Perhaps you reached across the table to take the hand of your beloved for the first time. Perhaps you remember important decisions made around the table. Perhaps you were reconciled with another over a meal. Perhaps your family still bonds by laughing at the time you forgot to add sugar to the cake. I think your mom did that once, didn't she? Uh, Food connects. It connects us with family. It turns strangers and to friends. It connects us to people. In the passages we're looking at today, this is the whole goal of Jesus' meals. That's his goal. He's looking to connect. To connect them, not only with each other, but ultimately to connect them to him. Verse 27, which we didn't read earlier from chapter 24, says that the two guys that he had dinner with, uh, before the dinner is what he said, he said that, and beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he interpreted to them the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So when he did that, yeah, in, in part his goal is to teach them how to read the Bible well, to see how all the Bible, the story of the Bible points to him, which is really, for that matter, all good stories always point to a hero, a, a savior. Um, but really the greater goal in that isn't just to see like, oh, that's kind of cool how Jesus is that, but really to relationally connect people to him. That's, that's, that's what it's meant to give rise to. Um, that's what the Bible's for. The point is to having relationship with Jesus. In the second story, with the second meal, this becomes even clearer. Look at verses 46 and 47. He says, she says, It is written that the Christ should su- suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. So, Jesus has already revealed himself as actually being the Christ. He does, says and does that numerous times in his time, ministry. Um, He is the Christ. Now, here he says his goal and hope is that people, which unfortunately is translated here as all nations. The Greek word behind it that's translated is ethnos, where we get ethnicity. So it really should be all ethnicities, all peoples, all colors of skin uh, might find repentance and forgiveness in his name. In Jesus' name. That tells us that Jesus' goal is to relationally connect people to himself, to him, his name, all that his name represents. I want us to look at this line on Packet Board. What is this repentance that he calls for? Um, How does this forgiveness work? And why his name? Why him? Uh, Here's the first thing I'd say. If if this relational reality is the thing that's going on, what is... What does it look like to look at repentance relationally instead of like just stop doing bad things? Okay. Um, if it's a relational thing, then really this is turning to God and looking for a relationship with him when there really hasn't been one. So most of the time, most people uh, mentally or whether they verbally acknowledge or not, deep down know there's a God or wish that there was one. Okay. Uh, we're just not sure about that at times or what that's really like because of this, this, or that. You know, whether it's fear, pride, hurt, stuff that's happened to our life. So what we do then, because we, we want and wish that there was a God that we could really know and connect with relation, we start looking for that relationship that we long for and design for. We start looking for it in another person. We're looking for it in another relationship. The problem is, is that sooner or later you will discover that people aren't perfect. Um, They'll end up hurting you. Any kind of meaningful relationship you end up in, there'll come a time when that person will hurt you. 
And what you find out in that relationship is that person is not perfect. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's a boyfriend, a girlfriend, even our kids. People hurt us. And in that, what we discover is that no human being, no human person is big enough or good enough to fill that deepest need of relationship that we have. That's why that happens. So this repentance, I believe, is really a, it's a turning to God and opening ourselves up to relationship with him when we rejected, when before we rejected that and looked for it in other people. Uh, likewise, the forgiveness thing is a relational thing. Forgiveness is only needed in relational contexts. I don't need forgiveness from the piece of wood I took my saw to this week to make our new bed frame. You know, like, <laughs> I don't need forgiveness from the wood because the wood isn't a person that I hurt with with my saw. Uh, now, if I hurt another per- an actual person with my saw, that's a different story. Which, by the way, um, the saw, our saw most of the time is our words. Uh, words, words cut much deeper than any other instrument. Even those who have suffered physical abuse say it's the things that were, were said, wow, what was done to them was done to them that have left a deep wound and scar. Ultimately, wherever there is a, there, there is a need for forgiveness, it's because there's been some kind of relational breach. That's why there's need for forgiveness. There was, there was disruption in the, in the goodness, the joy, and the hope of what the relationship could and should have been. So the forgiveness is a relational thing. And then here's the the kicker. Jesus says that he gives that forgiveness, that this relational breach between us and God, it gets healed and forgiven in his name. How's that work? How? I think it's like this. Remember, this is right after Jesus died on the cross and rose again in verse 46. He says that he suffered and died so that this repentance and forgiveness could take place. So what's the connection there? Jesus points to the cross as the means for those things to take place so that the relationship from, with God can be restored. In the Last Supper meal that we talked about earlier, Jesus said his blood spilled on the cross was this covenant sacrifice. He calls it this new covenant, new commitment in his blood. That his blood is, is paying this price for the wrongdoing. What's the wrongdoing? Rejecting relationship with God. That's the biggest wrongdoing ever. That's a big offense. Rejecting the person whom we ultimately all owe our existence to as our creator. The one who created us and designed us. And chiefly created us and designed us to be in relationship with him. And we reject it and remove ourselves from it. That's the offense. So what Jesus does is he... He absorbs the cost. He he pays the price in his blood so that the relationship can be restored. There's always a cost to restoration. Ever been in a car accident? In every car accident, someone's insurance company pays, right? There's always a cost for things to be made right. So Jesus uses his perfect life to pay the cost. When he rises from the dead, it's an announcement that his work, his work on the cross worked. That the payment is received. Now, then, all who look to him, look to his name, to receive forgiveness and get to be in relationship with God through him as the divine son of God. That's what this whole scene's about. Jesus shows himself to the disciples in order to convince them that he was, really was God and what he really did worked. And so now... Things are actually okay with them and with God. And that's reason for great joy. And now they can move forward in the mission and tell other people all about how good that is. And that's that's really the third piece. So first piece is breach of relationship with God. Second piece is that relationship restored. And then the third piece is that then because of that, then we can actually have healthy, good relationships with other people through that. Deep down, I... I believe this is what we really long for, to actually connect with God and to connect with other people. We want to connect. 